crazy. In 24 years, I'll be 76. Like when I was your age, I would have been like, that's ancient. Like that's the crypt keeper right there. Like, but to me, like 76, that's not so bad. Like, you know, oh, it's okay, you know. We'll see. Anyways, uh, 24 years ago, we did. We started Sanctuary 24 years ago. And actually, it's really cool tonight that we, I have two friends that are here were, that were there like in the early days. So I want to acknowledge Craig and Carly Horn who are sitting in the back. Raise your hand. Uh, they were part of Sanctuary. Uh, they started dating when they were part at Sanctuary. Now they've got three kids. Craig's on staff at Walnut Hill Church in Bethel. So you too in 24 years could be sitting in the back row with, you know, five kids and anyways. Some of you are like, yes! Some of you are like, uh, I'm gonna just walk out now, thank you. Anyways, uh, can I get like five or six people who are willing to pray for me and for us tonight? Awesome, thank you, thank you. Um, Anyone have a, a friend that's like the social networker? Like the friend that always is so good at introducing you to people, they're usually extroverted, and even like you'll be talking to one person, and you're like, wait, you're into photography? I gotta introduce you to this other friend that's into Scrabble. And then you see no connection, but you're like, okay, right? And then they, they find ways to connect you. Does anyone have a friend like that? Four of you, that's amazing. The generation with social media, like, no, I don't have one of those. You ever had those friends that, like, text you even? Like, uh, I want to introduce you via text to my other friend. Talk about awkward, like, hi. I can't even see you. Like, that's crazy. But there's always, usually in one group, there's the one networker who's always trying to build bridges to between other groups and connect you. I'm not talking about, like, Kind of like the schmoozer dude who's always like trying to like network to sell things, you know. I'm not talking about the Amway people. Like, I'm not talking about that. You guys even know what Amway is? All right, it's a pyramid scheme. Don't worry about it. Anyways, <laughs> it was 24 years ago they would have gotten that joke. All right. But every group has that networker, that extroverted person who loves to connect other people, other groups. And I, you're a good friend, so you should meet this other person who's awesome too. And you should meet because that's double awesomeness. Anyone would say that that's you? That's you, who you are? Oh, now you're all like, no. That's me. I'm that person. I love doing that. I love it even when you guys are here and, and I hear like, oh, someone's an artist, someone else is creative and we can meet, you know, like you guys should connect and worship people and even like, you know, oh, you like to play video games. Oh, I know someone else who needs prayer too. Like, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> it, <laughs> so I love introducing one person to another awesome person. Uh, and I want to introduce you tonight to one of my uh, best friends. And um, it's a friend that some of you know, some of you don't know. But I, I want to introduce you to uh, this person because um, they, they, there's a lot of misconceptions about this person. And uh, I can tell you, everyone that I've ever known that has met this person for themselves um, is blown away by some of the myths or misunderstandings or ignorance about them. So I wanted to, first of all, introduce you by telling them, telling you their, their name, okay? So it's a little bit hard for like uh, American Westerner, Westerners to say, so I'll teach you how to say his first name. His first name is Ruach. Did you hear that? Ruach. Ruach. Okay, it's not with a K. It's Ruach. Okay. His last name is Hakodesh. So his full name is Ruach Hakodesh. Okay, that's his original name. Let me tell you what that name means. It means the holy breath. The literal name means the holy breath or the holy wind. That's his name. If you haven't guessed it yet, we often refer to him as the Holy Spirit. I want you to introduce you tonight to my friend, 
the Holy Spirit. So I'm gonna do a message tonight that's not like crazy inspirational, it's more informational, because I want you to meet him, and the first thing I wanna do is talk to you about him, because even in the church, there are lots of people who don't really know the Holy Spirit, know some things about him, but don't really know him, and I even in the church, I see a lot of people don't know anything or jack squat about who my best friend is, one of my closest friends. And I want you to walk out of here tonight at the very least having a broader picture of who he is and real my heart's desire, whether it's tonight or tomorrow or next week or next month is next year, is that you someday will walk through these doors or I see you in a coffee shop and you go, Kevin, I met your best friend and now he's my best friend. He's my best friend. And I wanna talk to you about it. And the first thing I want you to notice is this. I wanna start by saying uh, some misconceptions about who the Holy Spirit is. And the first thing I want you to to know is this. The Holy Spirit is a person, not an it, not a force, not a nebulous energy. The Holy Spirit is not like Star Wars. The Holy Spirit is described in Scripture as a person. And believe it or not, the Holy Spirit didn't just show up in Acts chapter two in the New Testament. From the beginning, literally in Genesis, it said in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And he started out by saying, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the void that was not yet there. Hovering there over the darkness of the waters. And then God spoke. When God spoke, the Holy Spirit was moving because they're one. He is, and from Genesis to Revelation, the Holy Spirit is there, not as an it or a cosmic force, but as a person. I can get it why we think that way, because sometimes the the church talks about the Holy Spirit in ways as it's almost like an it, because we don't get it. I I used to think the Holy Spirit was out of the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was like the backstage manager. Anyone ever involved in drama? Right? The play, anyone ever see a play? Right? There's someone called the backstage manager who manages everything backstage. And so when there's scene changes, everything goes dark and you kind of hear a little bit going on and things are, and all of a sudden the lights go on and stuff's there. Something happened during the scene break. And the backstage manager who no one is ever supposed to see and they usually dress in all black because you can't see them when they're out there. We don't, we, we never see what happens but they do stuff. And sometimes that's how we think of the Holy Spirit. We don't really know who he is but I guess he does stuff because it says in scripture that there is a Holy Spirit but maybe he's like, I used to think he's like the backstage manager. Like he's there. But I don't know what he does. The other thing is I grew up in a church that was very traditional, very conservative. We used to sing, and and that that was great. I'm not saying anything wrong with that. But we used to sing this song every week called the doxology. Anyone ever heard it? Praise him from all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above all heavenly hosts. That's angels. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Can I tell you, when I was a kid, I'm like, what are we talking about in church? We sing this every week. There's a holy ghost. Like, I grew up during Ghostbusters. Casper the Friendly Ghost. I also grew up, don't tell my parents, watching Poltergeist. I know, seriously, Lord help me. Anyways, so when we talk about ghosts, that was never like, oh, that's a fun thing. And we're talking about the holy ghost. That's an expression of who God is. That freaked me out. But can I tell you, he's not, let me just also say this. The metaphors in scripture sometimes make him hard to relate to because he's referred to as a wind, as a dove. He's often referred to as oil or water or there are pictures of what, who the Holy Spirit is. And sometimes we're like, those are, how, how do you have a relationship with a cloud that comes into a temple? And it's because he doesn't have the physical body that you and I have. We often think that he's an it or a force, but he is a person, just like Jesus. But we think son, we understand that concept. Father, we understand that concept. Now, Father God doesn't have a body. Jesus 
has a resurrected body, but is not like our physical bodies anymore. He can walk through walls. He showed up in, to the disciples after his resurrection. He received a new body, but not like a physical body like us. So, but we can refer to, we can acknowledge, but we talk about the holy wind of God, and we're like, what? The holy breath of God, his spirit. We have to understand, but I want you to understand tonight that regardless of the fact that he doesn't have a physical human body like us, he is a person, not an it or a force. The second thing I want you to know right now is the Holy Spirit is God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the Trinity, triparts together. They are unified yet distinct. They are three distinct parts, yet forming in a perfect unity of three co-equals existing together. That should hurt your brain. Does anyone understand the, the concept of the Trinity? Put your hand down, you don't. We think we do. It's like, like we as mere mortals can't fully understand it. And we start to, well, it's like an egg and there's a yolk and a shell and a white. Yeah, that's helpful, but not, right? Because he's the only one that can be three completely equal yet separate in personalities. And there is the Father who is almighty God. And there's Jesus, his son, who is almighty God. And there is the Holy Spirit who is almighty God. He's not the farm league part of the, of the Trinity, He's not the JV team. He's not the junior part of the Trinity. He is co-equal with Almighty God because they're one together. And the Holy Spirit is not just some backstage manager, force, wind, it, wind, dove, things that shows up that is like the messenger of God. He is God. And he always has been and always will be. He's the Holy Spirit. He is the third part of the Trinity and co-equal. Now I wanna walk through some things that describe who the Holy Spirit is in his personhood. When I say person, I don't mean human. I mean that he is personal and he is distinct in himself. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Let's go. Let's go through the first one. So the first one is the Holy Spirit has a mind and a will. He has a mind. It's not just a cloud that's out there that, that, that he's not just a nebulous force without a distinct mind and personality. It's, here, read through this. The Holy Spirit has an intellect and knowledge allowing him to think, plan, and make decisions. He's not just a force. The Apostle Paul writes this, and by the way, this isn't an exhaustive message. These aren't all the scriptures we could talk about the Holy Spirit, and I'm not gonna cover everything with the Holy Spirit, but I do want to clear up some misconceptions. In scripture, it says this in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is not waiting for God to give him orders to do something. They are coexisting together. The Holy Spirit knows the deep things and thoughts of the Father and the Son, because they are unified together. And the Holy Spirit thinks just like God thinks, just like the Son thinks. He has a mind, and that mind is amazing. The Holy Spirit has a mind, and the Holy Spirit has a will. Just like we have a will, which distincts us from the person next to you, the Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit exercises his will in distributing spiritual gifts, in guiding believers, and in many other things in leading us. And his will is we're called to know it and then follow it and obey it. Here's a scripture, just one, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says this, but one and the same spirit works all things distributing to each one individually just as, what's it say? He wills. He wills. The Holy Spirit gives gifts as he wills them to us. We have a part in that too, but it's by his will that he distributes unique gifts at unique times to unique people for unique purposes for his perfect and complete will. The Holy Spirit has a will. The next thing is the Holy Spirit has emotions. One of them is grief. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Think about that. Think about that for a second. The Spirit of God 
has emotions. And one of them is grief. He can be grieved. Uh, Charlie Mead's here, and Charlie, one of the things that Charlie does is lead our support group uh, for those who are struggling with grief. Now, the Holy Spirit goes to Charlie's support group. Not because the Holy Spirit's like, Charlie, I need your help with my grief. It's because he wants to help others in their grief because he understands what it is to be grieved by something. Not in the same way we do, but in his own unique way. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and he says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. There are ways you can grieve the Holy Spirit and this verse is talked about in a lot, but the one of the biggest ways we can grieve the Holy Spirit is through resistance, both passive and active resistance. Passive resistance is when we don't even acknowledge who he is or what he wants or that he's there or that he lives in us or that he's called and gifted us for a purpose and he wants to partner with us. He can be grieved by our passive ignorance or, uh, of him and even rejection of him. He can also be grieved when we actively disobey what he's led us to do, to think, and to act. He's grieved by that. And I tell you, there's many people, pastors, churches, groups, and leaders that have grieved the Holy Spirit without even knowing it, and that's one of the biggest ways you can grieve the Holy Spirit. It's by not acknowledging of what grieves his heart. He can be filled with grief. He can be grieved. The next one is he can also love. The Holy Spirit also expresses love as demonstrated by his work in believers' lives and his role in the communion, the unity of the whole church. Paul says this to the church in Rome. He says, now I urge you, brethren, that means those who believe, brothers and sisters together, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. The love of the Spirit. First John says, John writes, he says, God is love. And because the Holy Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit is love and actively loves. And his love is active, both in affection and in action, and he loves. Would you stop right there and think about this truth? The Holy Spirit loves you. He loves you. It's not just some cosmic force or cloud that does things behind the scenes. He actively and personally loves you. He loves. And he loves the world around us too. The Holy Spirit communicates. The Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit speaks, guiding and controlling and comforting believers. He is depicted often as a communicator who desires to speak to God's people, both Old Testament and New Testament. John writes to the church in Revelation. Actually, it's Jesus. John writes it, but Jesus is saying this. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, this isn't Jesus saying, hey, if you've got ears. If you don't have ears, then you can just turn this off. That's not what he's saying. He's using a hyperbole to go, hey, if you're ready to listen, anyone who's ready to listen, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then you know, through the first three chapters of Revelation, the Spirit is speaking to the churches. In Laodicea and Philippi, Philadelphia, and all through. Uh, the Spirit is speaking because the Spirit has a will and has a heart and has a plan and it has emotions. And when the Spirit speaking to the churches, it's powerful what the Spirit says. And you can even hear grief in what the Spirit says to the churches that were not aligning themselves with the heart of God and the will of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy, Holy Spirit uh, is involved in intercession. He intercedes. Intercession is just a fancy church word for prayer. Can everyone say prayer? Prayer just means, it's, another, it's an old English word to mean to ask. Prayer is a form of, we know, more than just asking, but that's involved in it. And there can be human intercession as well, but 
the Holy Spirit intercedes for believers. Just drop down to what it says in Romans 8.26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. That's the other thing the Holy Spirit does. He's the helper. He helps us in our weakness. Anyone ever feel weak spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, financially, mentally? Is there another one? Keep adding it. Yep, yep, yep. Because the Holy Spirit loves and has a plan and his affections and a will for your lives and a purpose for your life. He, in the same way, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. And this is one way. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Anyone ever feel that way? I don't know what to pray. Me too. Me too. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now, there's a lot of conjecture over all that that means. And I'm not gonna dive into those waters tonight. I would love to another time, but not tonight. But this is one truth we can walk away from. The Spirit himself intercedes for us. Let me break that down for you. That means the Holy Spirit on our behalf is coming to the Father. But isn't he the same as the Father? Yes, I told you it will hurt your brain. But he is interceding for each one of us who believes on our behalf, in our weaknesses, before the Father. Scripture also says that Jesus is interceding on our behalf. When the devil starts to tell you that you're worth nothing, you can look at him and say, if I'm nothing, why is the living Son of God in his spirit interceding on my behalf? He thinks you're worth his time, effort, and to help you in your weakness so much that he is interceding for you. Here's a cool exercise to practice for the next 75 million years. Ask this question. Jesus, what are you praying for me about? Holy Spirit, what are you now interceding me for? Because can I tell you, they are really good at prayer. And maybe we should be partnering with what they're praying rather than trying to figure out our prayers all on our own. Holy Spirit, you're interceding for me. It says in your word, in my help, to help me and in my weakness. Holy Spirit, what's your prayer for me right now, even in this situation or this situation or this circumstance? What are you praying for me? Maybe I should start praying that. He loves to intercede because he loves us. And he knows we don't know how to pray. And there's ways he could do this. I'm not getting into the groaning part right now, but the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. The next one. The Holy Spirit is relational and wants us to know him. Now let me stop, and I want you to think through this right now. I first heard Graham Cook says this, and when he said this, it kind of melted my brain for a while until I'm like, yep, that's, that's true. God is love. God is love. God is love. Therefore, everything God does is relational in nature. Some of you just will have to chew on that for a while. Me too. But I will say that everything God does is relational in nature. That doesn't mean everything he does is what we want to happen when we want, how we want, because that's our terms of relationship that God did not click the button for. He knows better. He knows best. And so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is relational. He wants a relationship and wants us to know him. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, this is a blessing that Paul gives to the church. It's, it's called the grace in some churches. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ And the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That was a blessing. Paul's blessing the church with a spiritual truth that the Holy Spirit wants to be in fellowship. Let me tell you, fellowship is a church word for relationship, for meaningful, purposeful connection. It's the only time we ever use this word. 
He's, he's like church people. You know, hey, Porter, you want to grab some coffee? Because, you know, it'd be great to fellowship for a while. He'd be like, what? Say it to your coworker. Do you want a fellowship? They're like, what? Is it some kind of weird dating app? I don't really understand. <laughs> it's just a church word that we derive from the original Greek. It just means to be in close, purposeful, intentional relationship. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. We're gonna do something, okay? You ready to take a risk? All right. Look at someone next to you in the eye, and I want you to give them this blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, go ahead, say it to him. And the love of God the Father. And the deep friendship of the Holy Spirit. Be with you today. It's good. We'll do that 50 more times and it will be less awkward. Friendship. Second thing is relationally, the Holy Spirit wants to be our teacher and our guide. The Holy Spirit acts as a teacher. Now, some of you are already getting triggered to high school. That's not what this is talking about. Is in relationship as a rabbi to a disciple. That was a relational teaching relationship. John writes this in 14, it's actually Jesus' words. But the helper, there's that word again, he's also the helper. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring, you, uh, bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. One of the whole things the Holy Spirit does is he teaches, helps, and guides us in the understanding, a personal understanding of the teachings of Jesus. Anyone ever have a conversation with someone and they ask you a deep spiritual question and you're like, in your head, you're like, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Call Russ right now. Hey Siri, call Russ. Don't do it, he's doing it. Sorry. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, out of your mouth comes something you're like, that is better than I ever thought. You didn't just get smarter. The Holy Spirit was helping you to under, give an understanding for the question that was there. Everyone, anyone ever experienced that? Yeah, me too. Can I also tell you, I've had moments where I'm like, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. And the Holy Spirit needs to be like, you know, should study more. Anyways, okay. But he's our helper. And he teaches us. Can I tell you, when you're reading through scripture and to learn, to understand, you are not reading by yourself, you're reading with the author. Because the same Holy Spirit that lives in you wrote those words, inspired those words. And so, wouldn't it be fun tomorrow morning or tonight to start reading through the word and say, Holy Spirit, help me to understand this better. Holy Spirit, how can I put this into my practice more in my life? Holy Spirit, what are the hindrances that I've been putting in my life towards understanding this or following this or obeying this? And he will do it relationally. Last one. The Holy Spirit makes his home in us. Paul writes to the church in Corinth in six, verse, uh, chapter six, verse 19, he says, don't you realize, I love that, you know why he writes that? Because they didn't realize it. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. I am sorry when this verse has only been used as a weapon to guard you from stupid behavior. Now, hopefully it will. But that's not all that this should do is to put you in a place of fear and shame from making bad decisions with your body. The what Paul is trying to do is go, don't you realize it? That the presence of the living God is in you. Where he used to be in temples where he used to be located in one place for one time and you could only one person can go in there one day of the year 
and his spirit was on earth in one location, in the Holy of Holies. And if you went in there, it'd kill you. Not because God was trying to strike you dead. It's because you're coming into the presence of Almighty God and you can't handle it. Both your sinfulness and your weakness can't handle that level of holy power. But God didn't want separation. So through his son Jesus, paying the penalty for our sin, being our great high priest, made a way not for us to enter the Holy of Holies alone, but for the Holy of Holies to enter us. Think about that. God got rid of the temple so that you could be the temple. to dwell in you, to live in you, to empower you, to, for you to know him, to know that everywhere you go, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That means everywhere you go, you can be in his presence because his presence is in you. That's amazing. That's flipping amazing. Turn to the person on the right and left and say, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's a profound truth. Some of us have more addition to space for the Holy Spirit. Anyways, just keep going. Holy Spirit expansion, building expansion plan. Okay. Romans 5, 5 says this. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. The Holy Spirit wants to make his home in us. And can I tell you, he doesn't want just a little bit. He wants to fill you with all of himself. And he wants to fill us. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk on wine. All right, we should just close in prayer on that one, okay? (laughs) Now, the way you get drunk on wine, no, no, no one in here has ever gone through this, but you've seen movies, right? You drink wine... And the more it fills you, the more influence and control you give to wine. Everyone understand that concept? The more you drink, the more you're filled with wine, the more influence, control, uh, and yourself, you are surrendering to a substance. I'm sure you've never seen it in real life, but you've probably seen it on some movies or TV shows where people make the dumbest decisions you've ever imagined under the influence of alcohol or another substance that they filled themselves with. Everyone understand? So Paul says this, do not get drunk in wine, which leads to debauchery. Another great church word, which means stupid decisions that have really bad consequences because you're surrendering control to another substance that helps you make really bad choices. Some of you are even, I'm making light of it, but some of you are living with the pain ongoing of a decision you made under the influence or a really hurtful decision someone else has made either one time or continually and it's affected you negatively. Paul is using this as a metaphor to say this. Don't do that. Don't surrender Control and influence to a substance that's going to not help you, but hurt you. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Who doesn't help you make bad decisions, but leads you, guides you, teaches you, influences, transforms you, molds you into the image of Christ. Who is committed to God's purposes and plans in your life. Who fills you with his... His identity and your identity in him for you fills you with his gifts and empowered to do what you cannot do on your own, to bring the kingdom of God wherever you are. Not just to get through the day, but to bring heaven to earth. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I love when someone asks D.L. Moody, why do we need to be continually filled? Which, by the way, it's a Greek imperative ever-present term, which doesn't mean drink of the Holy Spirit once, but continually be filled. Just like tomorrow, you'll have to go back to wine, and the next day, back to wine. Every day, get filled with the Holy Spirit to come under his influence. And someone asked D.L. Moody, why do we, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit every day? And he said, because I leak 
The Holy Spirit isn't leaking out in a bad way. He's using it as a metaphor because sometimes I need a fresh infilling for today. I don't know about D.L. Moody, but I need a fresh infilling about every 15 minutes. All right, last thing. Connecting with the Holy Spirit. So hopefully I give you a broad overview of who the Holy Spirit is and what he's like. Not exhausted. I hope I just whet your appetite for the one who longs to be in you and to fill you and to love you, to guide you, to teach you, to empower you. So how do you connect with the Holy Spirit? I don't want you just to know about my friend. I want you to know him and to grow in your relationship with him. First thing is ask, seek, and knock. My experience is, this is not a, a formula, but the principle is this. The Holy Spirit comes when he is in, where he's invited and where he's wanted. As a church, as a small group, in relationships, and in yourself. Jesus gives this parable about a friend showing up at someone's house and eating bread. And at the end of the parable, Jesus says this in verse nine. And so I tell you, ask and keep asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Drop down to verse 13. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children who ask, seek, and knock, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit wants to be pursued, invited, welcomed, received. Even Jesus breathed on his disciples after the resurrection, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. They had a choice whether to receive him. Do I want to be filled? Do I want to receive the Holy Spirit? Do I want more of who he is in my life? Jesus in John chapter seven stands up in the crowd. He says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. And John writes, and you will be filled and it will become a spring of living water coming out of you. And John writes in the paragraph, he was talking about the Holy Spirit. We just didn't know it yet. Thirsty people thirst for water. Hungry people, hunger for more. If you're going, I want more of the Holy Spirit, but just a little bit, then you will be satisfied with just a little bit. And he will willingly pour out more, but he's waiting for sons and daughters who say, God, I need you, and I want you, and I want to know your love and your peace and your plan. I want your indwelling presence. You, the Jesus says you're the advocate, the teacher, the comforter, the helper, and I need all of that. And some of us would rather be zapped by a cosmic force than to pursue the one who wants to pour out all of himself into us, on us, through us, for us, every single day. And the last thing is this, and I'm sorry for going over time. Learn to be aware of his presence. You know, the people that you're closest to, you know the difference when they're in the room and when they're not. You know the difference for someone being across the room and someone who's near you and next to you. You know the difference between seeing someone from afar and being in their presence. Can I tell you, it's been a lifelong journey for me to learn how to be aware of the presence of the ever-present one, to acknowledge his presence, to seek his presence. So I just wanna pray for you. And hopefully I whet your appetite a little bit. Hopefully it cleared up some misconceptions. Hopefully it brings up about 50,000 more questions so that you will begin to ask and seek and knock, not just for a theological answer, and I hope you go for it, but a personal experience of the truth that's contained in his word. Just close your eyes and bow your head for a second. And I want to encourage you right now just to pray a simple prayer. If you meet it, Holy Spirit, I want you. I need you. Jesus, promise to send you 
And Jesus thinks, we need you. I want you to make your home in me. And if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. So maybe you just need to pray now. Holy Spirit, I want a friendship with you. I want to become more aware of your Eden-dwelling presence. I want you to come and fill me up. I even want you to rest on me, immerse me, envelop me in your presence. I want to be so close to you that even in the most stressful situations at work, I can stop and say, come Holy Spirit, and begin to engage with the Spirit of the living God. When I'm alone in my car or in my dorm room, I ask that you would flood me with an awareness of who you are in your presence. I want you to speak to me, lead me, guide me, help me, empower me, purify me, transform me, convict me of ways that I sin against you, grieve you, resist you, and I ask that you would change my thinking, my feeling, to all that I am and all I believe is in alignment with your purposes and plans for us. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would so invade the people of this place that as we leave tonight, we are carriers of the presence of the living God. Bringing hope and truth everywhere we go to a dying world who needs you. For your glory, we pray. Amen.